Xenoblade Chronicles is my favorite game of all time. As such, I've always wanted to cover it on the channel. Imagine my excitement when Nintendo announced a full HD remaster which would add more content in the form of an added epilogue. I was screaming when this happened, you guys. And really, I just want to delve into why I love this game so much, and why I truly believe that this game is one of the best ever made. Join me as I dive deeper into the world of the Bionis and the Mechonis to uncover why this game is so phenomenal. That being said, I am going to spoil everything about Xenoblade 1 and the epilogue Future Connected, along with some major spoilers for Xenoblade 2. I will go into Future Connected at a separate part at the end of the video, so you can go through the first part about the main game without any spoilers for the epilogue. If that's all good with you, let's dive right in. Visuals and UI So, in terms of the original Wii release, this game looked mm, far from stellar. Uh, the character models and facial expressions were often incredibly derpy looking and sometimes didn't really convey the emotions they should. This problem was even worse on the 3DS, which is the version I first played. A lot of people also found the UI to be very clunky at times. I personally never had too many issues with it, so I would have been fine if, for Definitive Edition, Monolith Soft had chosen to leave it untouched, but instead of leaving it, Monolith reworked it to be more accessible. For example, you can now more easily tell when an art will deal with additional effect, making it easier to tell where you're positioned around an enemy for arts that require it, or if an enemy has a status effect applied to them. Quest tracking has also been improved. One big issue I had with quest tracking before is that for the main story, quest flags would almost always reveal when a cutscene was going to happen. This part of the design of the game was unfortunately left untouched, and that isn't a big deal necessarily, but I would have liked to see that part of the quest flagging and tracking system reworked. However, Monolith did obviously make other changes. You can now tell where items for side quests are that you need to collect, and a dotted line will guide you to your destination. Quests are also indicated with little timers if they won't be available throughout the entire story and will eventually run out. I do think this change in particular might spoil that some big twists are eventually coming, but for overall convenience all of these changes certainly help a ton, but as someone who doesn't mess too much with side quests, I wasn't dying to see them personally. But for people who do go all out with 100%ing these games, this will be incredibly useful. On top of this, Monolith completely remade a lot of the previously mentioned character models, and these look absolutely stunning. And they are single-handedly the reason why I and many others thought this game was going to be a full-on remake at first. This being an HD upgrade, Monolith touched up a ton of the textures as well. While some of them still look incredibly muddy, I'd say this game graphically still looks on par, if slightly worse, than Xenoblade 2. The areas here do truly get a good treatment though. They really get the chance to shine and be even more beautiful than they already were. That being said, the game does struggle on a few occasions. In Definitive Edition, the game swaps to different resolutions when things get busy, even in docked mode. I didn't notice it as much later down the line, but when first starting the game it was extremely noticeable. Also something random I notice is that Othoron has these weird outlines around him that no other character really does. It was quite jarring and off-putting when watching the cutscenes he was in. The World Even on the original Wii version, one of this game's strongest points was its world. While in that version there was definitely less graphical fidelity, the game more than made up for it with how the Bionis and the Mechonis looked and were designed. They are simply stunning. There is a wide array of incredibly varied locations, from the calm town setting of Colony 9, to the ethereal wonders of Satoru Marsh, 
to the futuristic city of Alkama. These are just a few examples, but rest assured every area has something surprising and wonderful about it. Add to this the HD graphics from Definitive Edition, and you get one of the most beautiful games you will ever see. You've been looking at the footage, and I don't think that will even convey the beauty of this game properly. When you're playing it yourself, it looks even better. But arguably more important than how the world looks is how it's actually designed. This game takes place on two titans, and while the areas that you explore are all designed wonderfully, with all sorts of hidden secrets and resources to uncover, and like I went over just now, they're simply beautiful, they also fit together extremely well in terms of the world at large. When walking in an outside area like Gower Plains, Eris Sea, or Sword Valley, you can tell where you are in the world as a whole. From Gower Plains, you can see the upper body of the Bionis, and you can see the Mechonis looming in the background. From Eris Sea, you know that you're all the way at the top of the Bionis, since there's no more of its body above you. In Sword Valley, you can tell that you are on the sword of the Mechonis, since the two titans are both an equal distance away from you. The game does tell you where you are exactly, but even if it didn't, you could still tell by looking around you. That's what I admire about this world design so much, and it's why I think that even though Xenoblade 2 had more titans to explore, they felt more like a regular landmass and not an actual moving, living creature. You couldn't really tell that the thing you were on was an actual beast, and you couldn't exactly gather where you were located on it, mostly because there were no distinguishable points of interest like the Bionis and Mechonis had. So as a result, it might as well have been a giant landmass instead of a titan. I think the world in Xenoblade 1 was way better realized than 2's in this regard. Sound I can be brief here. Almost everything to do with sound in this game is absolutely incredible. First off, okay, the music. You, you, you gotta listen to this. The soundtrack of this game is simply phenomenal. Nearly all of these tracks stand out, have amazing composition, instrumentation, mixing, you name it. The remastered versions of these tracks, which have been playing throughout the video, are just as wonderful as the originals. I don't have a preference for either version of the songs, the remastered tracks sound more orchestral I suppose, but really I don't mind either way. They're all incredible. The voice acting is also amazing. The voices for some of the side characters can be a bit jarring, but the main cast is fantastic. Adam Howden as Shulk gives it his all in every scene he's in, which is nearly all of them. Shulk is obviously the centerpiece of the narrative, so having such a strong actor for him sells the story more as a result. Adam screams from the top of his lungs with so much emotion and delivers the calm lines with an incredibly warm tone. Adam sells Shulk. The other characters also feature great performances across the board. Every single one of them delivers their lines with the right amount of emotion, if a bit over the top in the most climactic scenes, but I think that kinda adds to the charm really. I'm not going to go too deep into the other voices as I don't have too much to say about them besides what I just mentioned, but they obviously deserve praise, so it would feel wrong to leave the other party members out of this section. Gameplay 
Okay, wow, where to even begin with this? I think a better place to start than any would probably be the basic controls, movement, and other miscellaneous things I noticed. Something I was shocked to find is that Definitive Edition doesn't actually support full 360 degree movement. I expected this to be something Monolith would touch up, but unfortunately it remains in the state it always has, which kinda sucks. Being stuck in between two directions you can move in with your analog stick is incredibly jarring as you jank around all over the place. It also makes the game feel a bit more dated than it needs to be. This clearly all harkens back to the design of the nunchuck, with those grooves around the control stick, so it feels weird to play on modern controllers that don't feature this kind of design. Something else that I was sad to find was that my precious jump physics were changed. <laughs> no, but in all honesty, this wasn't that big of a deal, and even though defying gravity is still entirely possible, it isn't as weird looking as before, so it goes a long way in making the game look more polished. Okay, I have to admit, when I played this game my first few times through, I didn't mess around too much with the Collectopedia. On my first playthrough, I didn't even know it was there, to be honest, and on playthroughs after, I did know, I just didn't touch it all that often, as I felt like it was kind of a waste of time. This time around, however, I actually went in on the Collectopedia way harder. I didn't 100% it or anything, but I definitely went out of my way to grab more blue orbs than I normally would, in the hopes of filling most of it up. I found the rewards really helped out and made it so I didn't really have to buy equipment from towns all that much or craft gems. Speaking of crafting gems, I will admit it's one of the systems in this game that I'm not very fond of. It's overly complicated for what it needs to do, and at the same time I think there's not a lot of depth within that complexity. It might seem like there is at first, because there are certainly a lot of mechanics at play that you can dig into, but at the end of the day, crafting gems comes down to finding the right gems, and making the strongest ones you can. All the fluff around this is just incredibly cumbersome. I think this process could be streamlined greatly, and I'm sad that Monolith didn't really dig into that, even though I do understand that it was probably to leave as much of the game untouched as possible, to allow for that pure experience the Wii version first offered. A new addition to Definitive Edition are the Time Attack Battles. These are very similar to the Challenge Battles in Xenoblade 2, and in that game they didn't do too much for me already, so in this case, it's no different. Hardcore players will absolutely get a kick out of it though, and it's a bit of a way to get more out of the characters you build up. You even get cute beach outfits from these challenges, so that's a great reward already. No, I'm not looking at Dumban, you're looking at Dumban, shut up. Anyway, another smaller feature that was added to Definitive Edition is HD Rumble support, and I think for this game it was absolutely stellar. It made inflicting critical arts incredibly satisfying, and besides that, the visions would have you more immersed, as you can feel Shulk's heartbeat from the controller while a vision is happening. It once again shows how cool this tech can be when applied properly. Lastly, for this first little section of the gameplay, the NPCs. I like most of the mechanics involved with them, like the affinity chart where you can see how all the people you've met are connected, their dialogue can also be pretty entertaining, but then, their schedules. Having NPCs tied to schedules seems realistic and cool, but in practice it can be incredibly annoying, especially when you want to complete all side quests in an area. I wanted to try doing so with my playthrough this time around, but I gave up right after Colony 9. Don't get me wrong though, NPCs and side quests are otherwise handled extremely well. I love for example that when doing a lot of the simpler quests, like collecting X material or killing Y monster, you don't have to actually return back to the quest giver. I was shocked that Xenoblade 2 didn't do this. It made the side quest so much simpler to pick up, and you'd be guaranteed to just complete a few along your quest, intentionally or not. It doesn't waste your time, and it's great for players like me, who want to go through the story and just collect some rewards along the way for some fetch quests, but also for completionists who want to get the game to 100% faster. That all being said, let's go over battling. This being a JRPG and all, you'll be doing a lot of it, and of course the battle system is great. The best way I can describe it would probably be like a lot of MMO battle systems, but with a bit more depth. You auto-attack by standing near an enemy and inflict most of your damage using the arts I mentioned before. Getting the most out of your arts requires a lot of quick thinking, positioning, and strategy. One of the best ways in which this is showcased is the visions. 
Major plot points in the game are mostly prefaced by visions, and the party working to prevent these visions from happening, or making sure that they come to pass. And now, these same visions appear very often in battles as well. This is such a great way to connect gameplay and story, but it also works incredibly well for the battle system on its own. Every so often when an enemy is about to use an attack, you will see a vision. You can see what kind of attack it will be, how much damage it will do, if it will inflict any status effects, and who it will hit. You can then work to change the future by warning your party members and having them perform an art, or by using your own arts. Shulk's Monado is often essential for changing the visions, as the Monado arts grant you a shield to block white arts, speed allows you to dodge most if not all red arts, and if all that isn't an option, you can also just inflict days on an enemy to cancel the current attack and force a new one. This makes the battle system so dynamic. Every time a vision comes up, it's a race in the few seconds you're given to figure out the best course of action. As such, there's really never a dull moment in battle, but it also makes more difficult encounters feel very manageable. Another important part of the battle system is the party gauge. It's divided in three chunks, and these chunks are a resource for reviving a party member, warning them about a vision, and having them use an art, but when all three chunks are filled, you can also use a chain attack. All of these features are vital in battle, but certainly one of the most unique is definitely the chain attack. The chain attack basically allows you to perform three or more arts in a row, and this can increase to at least 10 more arts, I believe. I think it's more, but either way, it's incredibly potent and can deal a massive amount of damage, or help you in dazing an enemy to cancel visions, for example. The party gauge and all these other mechanics add so much depth to this battle system. There is so much going on, but it's all pretty easy to get into, and even though the combat seems more on the slow side, there really is never a dull moment. You're constantly thinking about what to do next, and honestly, I don't think there's much more I could ask for than that. One of the other aspects of battling I truly got to re-experience this time around were the unique monsters. I was such a big fan of them on this playthrough. When first playing the game, I never really felt like I was truly on equal footing with them, and like I had to do some more grinding to beat them. But now, most of the ones I fought were just right in the challenge department. The battles were tense, and truly felt like they could go either way. It was in these fights that the battle system shone the brightest, as you need to make use of all the tools at your disposal in a tactical way. You often need to make decisions like, do I use an art now or save it for a vision? Do I warn this teammate or revive another one? Etc. So I am truly a huge fan of the combat system, but there are some nitpicks I have in terms of the battles. For example, when fighting a large group of enemies, things can get pretty messy. You can't simply walk through enemies and their collision hitboxes are often massive, so when a party member dies, you often have to go around a wall of enemies. The enemies themselves move all the time too, so it's even possible to get stuck in between a group, unable to do anything except use arts. Speaking of arts, another minor complaint I have is that it was often pretty annoying that arts proc their additional effect based on the state an enemy is in when the art lands, and not when it is used. I understand this being the case for special procs that are based off of status effects like topple, as it would be pretty weird to be able to daze an enemy after they're no longer toppled. That is the system, and something you have a decent amount of control over, so that isn't really a big deal. However, I mostly played Shulk, and it was often kind of frustrating that I positioned myself perfectly, but then the enemy decides that they don't want to look in a certain direction anymore, even though their aggro target didn't change, and so they turn around and the additional effect on my art doesn't proc, even though I did everything right. Again, it isn't a huge deal, but it's something I was never quite fond of. And then, there's tension. I can be very brief about this. I still have no idea what tension exactly does after multiple playthroughs of the game. I know it has an influence on hit rates, and I think the chance for another R to proc in chain attacks, but really, I'm still very unsure what the full effects are. I wish the game would explain that a bit better. So I can probably attribute this one to being more skilled at the game, but the boss fights were kind of pushovers on my Definitive Edition playthrough. They don't provide much of the challenge they did before for me, especially Zanza, the final boss, was disappointing challenge-wise. He used to be an incredible roadblock for me, but now I beat him pretty easily, 
which was kind of disappointing. There were only a few bosses that truly challenged me on this latest run, hardest of which probably being Lorthea. She is still a bitch. But this is mostly due to another minor complaint. When going after Lorthea and Dixon, there's a pretty sizable level spike, making the last few areas very grindy, which is in my opinion entirely unnecessary. Since I have been on the recommended level or only slightly below it throughout the entire game and that provided a good enough challenge. It also took away from these boss fights somewhat as the pacing came to a grinding halt and Lorothea had to sit there for an hour because my levels weren't high enough. Anyway, lastly, I praised the chain attacks just a moment ago, but they aren't perfect. In fact, I'm gonna give Xenoblade 2 some credit here. I alluded to it just now, but being able to use another art during a chain attack is randomized in Xenoblade 1. As a result, chain attacks can either be a total dud, or they can basically one-shot a boss. It is certainly less broken than Xenoblade 2's chain attacks, but I think Definitive Edition could have done away with some of the randomness of this system, as you never really know what to expect. Something that is important to note with this is that the party gauge in 1 does fill up incredibly fast, so you can throw out many chain attacks at the risk of them not doing too much, which makes up for the randomness in some ways. Xenoblade 2's chain attack system may have its own problems, mainly that it's incredibly broken and produces an incredible amount of damage, but I do like that it's consistent and you can really strategize your use of chain attacks against harder opponents. In Xenoblade 1, I found it to be a tool I mostly used to daze an enemy when a vision came up, but other than that, I rarely used it to deal damage, except when I was already doing well in the battle, as I simply didn't know if it was going to be worth it or not. So yeah, I wish the chain attacks were a bit more of a reliable tool, but I do still like them a lot overall, probably still more than twos really. Story. Alright, strap in. This will be by far the longest section of this video, but I gotta gush about how good this story really is. I'm gonna go over the moments, characters, and other story related stuff that really stood out to me. However, not everything is going to be included here. This won't be a plot summary. First off, let's go over some of the characters. I already praised the voice work for this guy before, but Shulk is by far the best JRPG character I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Shulk is so human and grows so much over the game, I think it's kind of incredible really. His reasons for starting the journey he's on are so relatable. I think everyone has wanted to take revenge on someone at least once in their life. I'm not saying that's necessarily right all of the time, but it's definitely understandable. I think in Shulk's case, it might be more justified in a way, since as far as he knows, the Mechon were just machines with no real mind of their own. But when Shulk finds out that that isn't actually always the case, he changes his stance. He adapts when his views are challenged, and in the end, he even joins up with the Machina, the very same ones that once took away his potential girlfriend to go against the very Titan he's called home for as long as he's been alive. Besides that, he has such a warm and curious personality that really sticks out in nearly all of his interactions. He wants the best for his friends and the people he cares about, and frankly that's heartwarming to watch in its own right. Really, I almost kinda developed a crush on Shulk, he's that inviting, yet complex. Next up I wanna highlight Fiora. Honestly, she's brilliant as well. Since you already have a connection with Fiora from the start of the story, she's a great way to push the narrative forward. Her death is the reason why Shulk sets out for revenge, but when the party discovers that Fiora is, in fact, still alive, she becomes the objective of their adventure in another way. Now she can be saved. So that pushes Shulk forward even further to get her back, and you, as the player, want to see Fiora back too, since you not only like her, but you like Shulk, and Dumban, and Ryan. You want to see them get the happy ending they deserve as well. That being said, Fiora is also a great character in her own right. She's selfless and wants nothing but to see the people she cares about be happy. You can see this as well with her and Mayneth inhabiting the same body. I feel like most of the other characters in the game would have been highly disturbed if they were in Fiora's shoes. But Fiora accepts it. She likes Mayneth even. 
Fiora wants to help her achieve her goal, even if she has to give away her own body to do it. I think this is by far Fiora's strongest display of character, and it honestly makes her immediately likable. The two souls inhabiting one body concept is also really interesting and plays out in quite interesting ways. For example, how Mayneth and Fiora swap consciousnesses around at certain intervals. At first, this is kind of disturbing to watch, but after a while, they start to grow more towards each other and they are both striving to help each other. They almost become one in a way, which is not only really cool when things start getting real on the Mechanis, but it also signifies their connection in an oddly effective way. I'm aware Xenoblade isn't the only piece of media that's ever done this, but I think the progression of the relationship between Maineth and Fiora was developed in a very natural way. Alright, and then, my boy, okay? The Hero Pan Riki is such a good boy, and no Napan this series has seen, or ever will see in the future, will ever surpass him. He's a volleyball, he's a dad, he's funny, he's cute, I don't know what else you could possibly want out of this fluffy balloon. Riki will forever be tied with Shulk as my favorite thing in this game, and I absolutely love this guy. Charla is definitely not one of the best characters in the game, though this totally doesn't mean she doesn't have her moments. She is still a nicely developed character, but she's just one of the lesser characters in a cast of phenomenal ones so it really isn't a slight against her in any way. She just doesn't get too much of a chance to shine very often, but when she does, it's still very strong. Having Sharla really get this time when on the Mechanis, with more insights into her story, gives a much needed edge to her character. It also gives more emotional impact to her journey that was sorely missing after her first arc was over. Gado had been teased a lot throughout the game, and having him appear here after it was near certain he died was really great to see. Charlotte's first arc wasn't as great on its own, but in reality her introduction was really just a setup to the Mechanis arc. That arc is the reason why Charlotte's inclusion in the party is more than warranted, because it is a great payoff to all that setup. One of the most important parts of her character really gets the payoff it deserves here, her relationship with Gatto. It's a shame Gatto doesn't make it out alive to develop it further. That's really the only thing I can slight this part of the game for, and maybe also that this arc doesn't go on for very long. Other than that, it really hits the emotional beats it should. Melia I also didn't think too much of my first go around, but I've grown to like her way more over my multiple playthroughs. She still isn't my favorite, but I can really appreciate the lore and world building that is involved with her story. The lore of the High Entia is so layered and complex, and without it, Melia's arc wouldn't have been nearly as strong. The way the traditions of the High Entia even delve into selecting wives from both the Homs and High Entia for the Emperor, and having children with both of them to dilute the gene that turns High Entia into Telethia, is going far in thinking out the lore to a level you don't see very often. But because it is so in-depth and goes so far, it makes the lore feel thought out and believable. It is such a big brain twist, and it immediately makes a lot of the customs of the High Entia more reasonable. It's rooted in a need for survival, which I think we can all get behind, really. Now, diving into the villains, Metal Faves is a fantastic example of a villain that plays really well off of the main party, and the way he talks about Fiora and prior encounters really establishes a heavily conflicting dynamic between him and the party. Also, how he completely embraces going from Mooncar to Metal Faves is so amusing to watch. He isn't awfully deep, but he doesn't need to be. He's a good example of how being hungry for power can lead you down a descent of madness. The twist that he's actually Moomkar is pretty obvious, but seeing Dumb Man's reaction when he realizes it is still very impactful, as they were friends in the war after all. But to get to the absolute cream of the crop, oh, so incredible, Egil is the absolute strongest villain in the game who completely contrasts all of the ones we have seen thus far. He is introduced as a cult strategist who has been playing everything behind the scenes. When you then learn about his backstory, along with that of the ancient past and how the Bionis turned on the Mechanis, frankly it puts everything into perspective. Egil really at the end of the day wanted to prevent similar tragedies from happening again. He also wanted revenge much like Shulk did at the start of his journey. 
Egil is incredibly ruthless in his methods though, so there is still no question that he needs to be stopped for the people of Mechanis and Bionis, but these qualities add more deep and poetic layers to his character. To see him come around at the end, also much like Shulk, and him dying just when peace seems to have been achieved is made all the more painful by this. Now, I want to go over some standout moments from the story itself, but I want to preface this by addressing a complaint I've seen raised many times when discussing this game. Namely, that the story really only starts to get good once you get to Prison Island for the first time, and honestly, I think nothing could be further from the truth. Not only does the story have an immensely gripping start with the attack on Colony 9 and Fiora's death, but the first act sets up so many things to make the later acts hit so much harder than they would have otherwise. Everything in this game has a setup and a payoff. Really, I can compare this game much to something like Science Gate in terms of its storytelling. Science Gate is often criticized for being a slow show to start, but this slow start is all the buildup that is necessary to deliver on the incredible climax that it has to offer. And to be honest, I think this buildup is really exciting to watch unfold. And the same goes for Xenoblades. They're obviously smaller scale stories than what they're building up to, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. In the case of Xenoblade, stepping out onto Gower Plains for the first time, seeing Shulk come to grips with his visions, preventing Otharon's fated death, it's still incredibly exciting, just in a different way from the climax of the story. Now with that said, this might sound hypocritical, but I'm not going to talk about the first act of the story much at all. While it is absolutely great and worthy of praise, I think at the end of the day, the events of the first act are pretty straightforward in their storytelling. I will reference back to some moments from the first act at some points, where we're going to be mostly going over things starting at our first visit to Prison Island until the end of the game. To address the elephant in the room first, people like to ship these characters around and honestly I can really see why. The romance stuff is handled incredibly well. It's in no way overbearing, but rather incredibly charming and sometimes even funny, as I think it should be. Hearing Dunban tell Shulk that he would like him to be with Fiora, Shulk kissing Fiora to try to get her to drink water, and seeing Melia's feelings towards Shulk play out increasingly over the course of the story, culminating in this. It's all so sweet to watch. I do feel sort of bad for our high Entia princess because at the end of the day, only the cyborg gets to take home the prize. Even I'm a little jealous. Either way, let's dive into some other moments that really stood out to me because man, the way the story slowly builds up to the confrontation with Metal Face and Nemesis is nothing short of amazing. There is so much mystery and intrigue that has you on the edge of your seat at all times. This is in no small part due to Shulk's visions. Almost every new area you visit adds a new piece to the puzzle through the visions, and the revelations you learn about the Monado and the Faith Mechon, Zanza, Fiora, as well as Shulk's determination in general after these events are more than a satisfying payoff, but again, they are also another setup for the next arc as well. This single event has so many lasting consequences to the story, and it is here that the story truly starts transcending to the extraordinary. Then, splitting the party off after the Galahad Fortress battle is such a great way to get some one-on-one -on -one character interactions that deepen the characters so much, but also in unique, meaningful ways. Charlotte and Ryan talking about how their pasts have affected them, and Ryan very subtly implying a crush on Charlotte is so needed for these characters who were otherwise kind of static throughout the game. Shulk and Fiora meeting again was of course incredibly adorable, and a very satisfying payoff for the hours we spent tracking her down. But my absolute favorite interaction in the entire game happens in this part as well. After making their way around the fallen arm of the Mechonis, Riki notices that Melia is tired, but no, she doesn't want to actually admit that, so he takes that burden off her by proposing to stop for a while. This brings out such a smart and caring side of Riki that we barely get to see. The audience is kind of in Dunban's position, amazed at this otherwise goofy, bouncy ball being so careful with Melia and her feelings. Riki then talking to Dunban by the campfire, wanting to hear about his story and his worries, and basically just talking about being dads with him, 
brings out the best in both of these characters. The sweet yet goofy daddy pawn and the strong and loving brother make a great pair. I swear, Riki is the best thing in this game. I was crying when this scene happened, okay? Riki is too much for me. He is too adorable. Ah! But really, Mekonis is just great in general, honestly. The fact that you get to explore it after it has been looming over you throughout the entire game, only for it to be more similar to the Bionis than it would seem, is yet another great twist in a story so chock full of great twists. This world completely subverts your expectations and it humanizes the machina even more than their personalities already do. From the landscape, they seem to go through many of the same struggles as the people on Bionis, up to debris falling from the sky. They literally call back to this and the moment I realized it, I was like, damn, that's clever. Though their circumstances obviously differ, showing us that the machina are not that different and having a half machina in our party ourselves makes fighting for them a logical step that we're more than willing to take. After all, they're people too. And then, the story slowly starts building up to another climax. The weighted pieces are slowly put in place for Dixon's betrayal and Sansa's reawakening is absolutely masterful. The closer you get to the event, the more pieces are once again laid out in front of you. Of course, having already played the game, I knew what would happen, but I remember when I first played Xenoblade on the 3DS. Nothing truly started making sense until the moment it all happens. All of the events that occur leading up to this moment completely make sense, and it's honestly exhilarating in a new way to play through the game again and see how you could already tell some of the questionable things happening and how you could totally see yourself falling for it. Dixon talking about deceiving the party in Satoru Marsh seems like a strange comment at first, as up until his inevitable betrayal, he does nothing but help the party. He helps in fights, makes weapons, and that too makes complete sense. He wants the Bionis or Zanza to win, and will do anything in his power to support the party, aka the biggest chance he has of making that happen. Shulk being a vessel for Zanza all along, completely recontextualizes his ability to use the Monado in the first place, one of the biggest mysteries throughout the entire game. I don't think there are enough words of praise I could give these twists. It's because they are so incredible that Xenoblade 2's twists felt so lacking in comparison. None of the plot twists in that game had nearly as much of an impact on the overall story as many of the ones in Xenoblade 1 do. Regardless, the emotional aftermath of all this is also wonderful. It has been built up that Melia has a crush on Shulk, and as such she's kind of jealous of Fiora, who Shulk seems way more into. Melia then having a heartfelt conversation with Fiora, and them developing a friendship anyway, shows how strong these characters really are. Melia being able to put her own feelings aside for Fiora, and Fiora then trusting in Melia to help Shulk if by any chance Fiora happens to not make it out, is simply tragic and heartwarming at the same time. On top of that, these characters haven't had the chance to really talk much, so then developing a friendship here really adds to the overall bond the group shares, and it makes you care that much more about the outcome of the upcoming battles, hoping that everyone will make it out okay, so the worst doesn't come to pass. This is somewhat gameplay related, I guess, but I'll just put it here as it also kind of neatly ties up your journey in a nice bow. The final gauntlet before you face Zanza is just great. I'm such a big fan of refighting old bosses before the final one to see how far you've come along your journey. It's fantastic. Along with it taking place in a simply beautiful outer space setting, this is one hell of a way to cap off the journey. And then, you get to Zanza. Even though I criticize the fight for being a bit on the easy side, it is definitely still incredible. Sansa's designs here are so great, mixing both elements of the Bionis and the Mechonis into his design, signifying his reign over the entire world and both Monados. He really feels like a being that is just above you, like a cosmic deity who is truly at one with the world. The designs of the Monados here are also great. On top of that, the ending is incredibly satisfying. Klaus and Mainness' existence before the world of the Bionis and Mechonis came to be, and that world being man-made on top of that, opens the door for all sorts of different universes in the future, as Xenoblade 2 would later prove. Alvis literally being the Monado, or a computer regulating the world, explains why Alvis was even able to use the Monado in the first place. 
but it also kind of explains his weird, distant attitude. Shulk then creating a new world without gods, seizing his destiny, neatly wraps up the story with the core message. You can choose your own path, your own destiny, your own future. You just need to grab it with both hands. The final cutscene shows all of the races you've met along your journey living together in harmony, but this cutscene takes place from the eyes of Fiora, interestingly enough. All characters in the main party get the chance to have their last few moments in the spotlight, and it is revealed that Fiora has managed to get her Hom's body back with a sick new hairstyle to boot. I love this ending. Even though the character's suffering throughout the game hasn't been undone, everyone still gets their happy ending. The title screen even changes to signify this, with the main party hanging out, watching over the sea, and the ruins of the Bionis. Future Connected That is the end of Xenoblade 1, but Definitive Edition, as I mentioned, added the new epilogue story Future Connected, which takes place one year after the events of the main game, on an entirely new location on the Bionis, the shoulder. With that said, don't play Future Connected before finishing the main story. The first cutscene literally spoils the ending, so if you thought that starting out with the extra story was a good idea, it's not. Play the main game first, trust me. Then again, if you're still watching this, I already spoiled it for you anyway, so go nuts, I guess. Anyway, jumping into Future Connected, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't think we were going to get something on the level of Torn at the Golden Country for Xenoblade 2, so I'd say my expectations were pretty tempered. But man, oh man, what a mess this epilogue turned out to be. But before I get into that, let's start off with the positives. I really, really like the new outfits for Shulk and Melia. Melia's outfit is just beautiful yet regal at the same time, and I really like the more casual appearance Shulk has. These outfits both accentuate their personalities really well, honestly. Then, this story features some new music, and as we've come to expect from Xenoblade, it is once again phenomenal. I especially really like the battle theme. It kind of reminds me of Torna's battle theme, and anything that reminds me of that is guaranteed to be a masterpiece. The new party members exclusive to Future Connected, Nene and Kino, have something cool going on, though I'm gonna complain about them later. But for now, they are... In fact, my boy Riki's children! Woo! -hoo! Anyway, a gameplay change in Future Connected that I would say I 100% enjoy more than the system in the main campaign is about the gems. Like I said before, I wasn't a big fan of the gem crafting, so in Future Connected, how do you obtain gems? You just get them. You get them from either crystal deposits. It's great! and really something I wish the main story allowed for. I get this was probably done as it's a shorter experience, but nevertheless, it was a positively surprising change. I'd say the best part of this story was Tyrea. She was brought back after trying to kill Melia in the main story, and really the best moments in this story are all the scenes where she is present. But once again, gonna complain about this later. Shulk's new Monado replica transformation was super badass, and coming back to Alchemoth after it had been completely destroyed was honestly immensely satisfying and powerful. Walking the once crowded halls of the city really gave you a moment to look back on everything that had happened, and seeing to it that it can go back to its former glory was probably the only reason I didn't completely fall asleep during the final boss. The quiet moments, kind of the equivalent of the heart to hearts from the main game, are often incredibly charming. I found basically all of the charming ones to be between Shulk and Melia though, so I don't know what that says about Nene and Kino, but you're gonna find out soon, let me say that. Finally, probably the strongest point for Future Connected is that overall, the world is very well made. It's easily an area that could have been in the main game. There is a lot of side content to do for the people who want it, so if you're more into Xenoblade for the gameplay than the story, to which I say, what? Why? You'll absolutely get something out of this epilogue. And yeah, that's about all the positives I have to say about Future Connected. And now I really want to highlight why this epilogue is such a mess. For starters, the voice acting. The voice acting for Shulk and Melia is pretty different here, and it is at points quite jarring. 
Both Shulk and Melia's voices sound less energetic, and they really didn't captivate me the way they did in the main game. The other party members, Nene and Kino, sound absolutely terrible. The voice actor for Kino sounds like they're trying way too hard to sound childlike, and Nene just has this annoying tone in her voice that I can't quite put my finger on. Just the voice direction in general is so off. Shulk often sounds like he's speaking in slow motion, Melia sounds like she's falling asleep, Kino's overdoing it on the child angle, like, what went wrong here? It's very much obvious that the voice directing for Future Connected changed, but when putting it side by side with the base game, it really shows how terrible it truly is. We know for a fact that Shulk and Melia's voice actors can do so much better than this, so I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the poor voice performances are most likely due to the directing. Another odd thing I noticed was that there are a ton of instances where the spoken dialogue don't match the subtitles on screen. And we're not talking about some slight grammatical error, I can understand a few of those slipping through the cracks, but no, we're talking about entire sentences being almost completely different. On top of that, the sound mixing is also kind of off compared to the main game. The music often drowns out the quieter performances by the voice actors. All of this happened so early on, my first impressions were already pretty bad. I was not even an hour in and I already thought this epilogue was a rushed hack job, but I also thought that it might be able to turn itself around. Good thing it didn't. So then, next on the list, let's talk about the story itself. The story is so ass, it's unbelievable. I want to go over the party members first because holy, they are bad. Nene and Kino are absolutely awful and add nothing to the story. They don't get any meaningful comments and are almost always sidelined in the cutscenes because the adults are talking, as it were. The only thing these two are really good for is provide some more insights as to how the best boy Ricky is doing! Yes, Ricky! But really, the one thing that confused me the most is that Nene plays exactly like Ryan, and Kino plays exactly like Sharla. Monolith, let, let, me, let me tell you something. If they're gonna play exactly like Ryan and Sharla, why not have Ryan and Sharla as the party members? You know, characters we actually like? But believe me, the story fun doesn't end there, because remember how the main story had such a good way of building things up and then delivering a satisfying payoff? Well, future connected shits all over that. First off, there is no interesting conflict in this epilogue. We were heading to Alchemoth to get something or whatever, and oh no, there is suddenly a rift and a monster to keep people out, so we crash land on the Bionis shoulder, which happens to still be floating around for some reason. Okay, then we get to this village of High Entia we don't know anything about. They give us a speech about how they can't go back to Alchemoth or whatever. And then this Galgar guy comes up who is obviously evil, gives us an ominous speech, and then he runs away like some Kingdom Hearts villain. Then we try to go to Alchemoth, but what do you know, we can't reclaim it. So then we find this random ass kid who has a whole laboratory for some reason, and then all of a sudden Tyrea is there. Okay. Like I said before, the best and only truly good scenes in this epilogue are the ones Tyrea is in, but there are only like, two good ones. And then still Tyrea's character goes absolutely nowhere. Galgar shows up after this touching reunion with Tyrea, and after that, he literally goes away for the entire story, and he is never heard from or seen again. What is this writing? They throw so many plot points in for the sake of throwing them in, but they never go anywhere. The main villain turns out to be literally some fog monster called the Fog King that isn't even sentient, and the rift the Fog King comes from gets closed by Melia at the end of the story with no further insight into what it actually is and where it came from. What is this writing? This is all the story built up to, and nothing is actually explained about any of this. The game sort of gives the explanation, well, maybe it's because of New World Syndrome or something, but how is this in any way interesting? I would have even preferred Galgar being behind it at this point, then maybe there might have been something more to it, but no. There are other characters who appear in this story, but I'm gonna be real with you, they are so uninteresting and unimportant, I don't even remember their names. 
So honestly, not missing out on much by skipping over them really. So to close things off, in a nutshell, the story is absolute garbage. Nothing goes anywhere. Galgar goes nowhere, Tyrea goes nowhere, the Rift goes nowhere, the Fog King goes nowhere, Nene and Kino are literally the worst party members in all of Xenoblade except for Tatsu if you can even call him a party member, and all of this is such an enormous waste of time. I was so uninvested in nearly everything going on in this story, it sucked real real bad. Now with that out of the way, let's dive into more of the gameplay. The most important new addition to Future Connected is probably the Pawn Spectres. They replace chain attacks in this story. You clear side quests to add more Pawn Spectres to your team, and after a while, your chain attack replacement, the Union Strike, will become available. Clearing these quests and adding more Pawn Spectres to your team is incredibly satisfying, but that said, so many of these quests are in the most annoying places. So much backtracking, so much going around a large part of the map. I hated this. That being said, once the Union Strike is available, you can choose from a few of them. All of the versions do area of effect damage, but one heals your party and removes debuffs, one does a lot of damage to one enemy, and one forces daze on all enemies in a certain radius. These are all very useful, but they're not at all satisfying or tactical to use, unlike chain attacks. Even though I bashed those earlier for not being strategic enough, at least you still had to make decisions when using them, like what arts to use, swapping to an art of a different color or not, etc. Here you just click the one you want and there you go, that's it. Just do the quick time event and there will be no further thinking required. Overall, this system is so much weaker compared to the chain attacks. I get they added this instead to pad out the game time, because the Pawn Spectres are essential for beating certain encounters, but I really wish the chain attacks were still here, and then maybe the Pawn Spectres could also be in, providing similar effects as they do now, just toned down by a lot. One last nitpick I have about the Pawn Spectres is that they are all on screen when battling. They're a nice progress indicator throughout your adventure, but really when you have Nene and Kino on your party, and you need to revive them in a hectic battle, Having 10 other models on screen that look exactly like them really doesn't help much. I often found myself struggling to find Kino especially. I don't think this was really thought out very much. A very bare bones mechanic that was added in this epilogue is the Fog Beasts. Fog Beasts give monsters in the area buffs and draw them in, but that doesn't really add much, as in most cases you can pick off the surrounding monsters anyway. So now it basically comes down to, oh, I see Fog Beast I want to kill. I kill all surrounding enemies one by one, and then I just go in for the kill, and it's almost like the Fog Beast buff doesn't exist. The combat system in general is also just so much worse here. Not having the visions makes the combat incredibly random, and there's not a lot of strategizing that can be done. I get that it's gone from a storytelling perspective, but that doesn't mean I have to like the execution. The strategy aspect that was so strong before is just basically gone now. To cap off this section, there are a few final points I wanted to touch on. For one, it's incredibly jarring how the final boss uses Zanz's battle theme for the first phase. Like, really? There was new music composed for regular battles and a ton of other parts of Future Connected, but the final boss is where you draw the line? The second phase does have an original track, but I was incredibly put off by hearing a battle theme meant for literal god being played over a fight with something that might just be the opposite of godlike. And speaking of the final boss, why in the living hell do you go back to the title screen where you're beaten by it? Like, are you for real? Even the main game doesn't do this with Zanza. Why can't we just restart outside of the arena, on the bridge that we are already able to access in the main game and should be easy to carry over to here? This decision was beyond baffling. And finally, the ending. It was okay. Seeing Melia being coronated was a fine way to cap off her story, having Tyrea there and help her out was nice, but really all of this runs so hollow after this mess of an epilogue. This ending was not worth this entire shit show in the slightest, and I would rather have had this being completely removed, because Future Connected honestly brings the entire experience down. That all being said, do I still like Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition? And what? Yes, of course I do. Look at the title of the video but as a package with Future Connected, it is definitely not as consistently strong as just the main game. 
On any playthroughs I do after this, I will absolutely ignore Future Connected and only play the basically 10 out of 10 portion of the game. And frankly, if you haven't played the game somehow and are still at the end of the video, I recommend you do too. I have tried my best to explain why Xenoblade, to me, is so fantastic, but really, I would like everyone who has an interest in the game to try it out for themselves. It's thoroughly engaging, and I have no doubt that it will leave you with something to look back on fondly when everything is said and done.